Hi, I'm Dawn Tura, President and CEO of Sourcing Industry Group, and I want to welcome you to our Inside Source Executive Video Series. With me today is a legendary John Scully, who I'd like to call my new friend as well. So John, I just got through reading your book, and as you can tell by my stickies, I was all over it. And we talked, in the book you talk a lot about talent management, and we're moving into the gig economy, and the, the entire workforce is going to be changed in the future. Can you share some of your insights on that? I, I can, and I have seen the importance of tools from the early days of the personal computer industry with things like spreadsheets and PowerPoint to now we see collaboration with uh, tools like Slack. Uh, that in the gig economy, we need tools that enable the people who have responsibility for recruiting the talent the procurement organizations, the human resource organizations, to be able to understand how do they strategically uh, set their plans to acquire the right mix of talent for the projects mm -hmm. that are increasingly becoming strategic, often leading them into new domains that may not be traditional for their organizations. And so, uh, the company I'm involved with, PeopleTicker, uh, is taking big data analytics, unstructured data, and we built the largest data source for two things. One is the pay rate for any job in any city in the US and 10 other countries going to 100 countries, and the bill rate. And why would you want to have people dealing with opaque information mm -hmm. at a time when data analytics can actually say, we can do better than surveys, uh, that's like having a, a, a flip cell phone. You know, we're in the era of smartphones where people get things instantly uh, and with accuracy from cloud computing. And so the ability to, to go in and strategically be able to determine, you know, what if I source people in this city versus that city or even overseas? Uh, what if uh, I look at a different type of talent? Um, how should I think about the pay rate and bill rate for that for that talent, and that's really what we do at PeopleTicker. And you also talk about the fact that we are going to be moving to a larger contingent workforce, so having access to that information is going to be more important because people aren't going to be staying in jobs forever. Sure, um, Intuit has forecasted by 2020 that the gig economy, the independent contractors, freelancers, will be 40% of the U.S. workforce. Think of that, 40% of the U.S. workforce. So that's where the momentum of new jobs are being created. There are estimates by 2030 that 60% of the jobs that will be considered skilled jobs don't yet exist. Mm -hmm. So new types of uh, skills are going to be required as we move into eras of automation, of machine learning, uh, taking over many of the old skilled jobs. And so new skills are going to be involved being able to use these kinds of uh, important tools. So. I think that the role of contingent labor, the role of procurement is inevitably going to be more and more strategic. And there has to be an alignment at the CEO level between when do we hire perms, when do we hire uh, contractors, and the greatest flexibility, the fastest way to get into a new domain is to uh, take advantage of the strategic opportunities for talent through procurement. That's true. You can bring in the good talent. Absolutely. And, and yeah. yeah, I love that. So I have to talk about one thing in, that you said in your book, and I wish every educator in the world could hear it. You said answers are like commodities these days. Yes. And yet we train students to memorize, rote memorization, you know, and yet we don't train them to ask questions. And that was such an aha moment to me because we do. I, I can't remember what I learned in high school any longer. Yeah, no, it's, it, not I, it's absolutely true. And I can remember when I was a student, we would uh, memorize long lists of dates and facts, and then of course, some months later, we will have forgotten all of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, facts can easily be uh, sourced as a commodity from Wikipedia, from Google. So why are we focused on facts? We ought to be teaching uh, students to understand the context of facts, and the context of facts is asking the right questions. Uh, learning is about uh, putting information into context. And a skill of learning is learning how to ask the right questions. So as we go forward, that's the way we're also going to be able to be innovative. If Absolutely. we ask the right question, we're, we're going to get to something that we never thought about before. Yeah, and, and increasingly, Don, uh, 
even the most successful companies are going to become victims of their own success yes. unless they adapt to the new domains that are starting to converge into what they think of as their industry. And if they don't adapt to those new domains coming in, entirely different uh, knowledge base, skill base, uh, that's why procurement of independent contractors is so important, uh, then they're going to be the uh, consequences of somebody <laughs> else's success. <laughs> and so you talked about innovation also happens at the fringe. It's not happening usually at the center with yeah. the big Goliaths any longer. That's true. But, but they think that they know it all. Yeah. So, so, so uh, let's take Kodak. I mean, Kodak thought that digital photography would happen someday. They were, uh, in fact, the inventors of the first digital mm -hmm. camera. And yet, at the same time that uh, Steve Jobs was creating the iPhone, uh, Kodak was focusing on doubling down on film processing, putting billions of dollars into you know, further vertical integration so they could compete on cost more effectively with Walmart, who also had a single-use film camera. Mm -hmm. And Steve Jobs was there at the right moment as the wireless operator said, we can s send photos over 3G wireless where we could only send text over 2G. And Steve put a cell phone chip inside of an iPod, and you know the rest of the story. Well, I wish I invented the selfie stick, I'll tell you that. I would have been a millionaire with that alone. So we talk about the Internet of Things and you know, the fact that everything is going to eventually be connected, 50, 000, 50 billion yes. connected devices uh, per John Chambers. What do you think about the Internet of Things? How far is it going to go? Are we at the tip of the iceberg? Where are we? Well, we're still at the tip of the iceberg. And while many people talk about smart homes and uh, many of the consumer devices like, like wearables, the early opportunities for huge uh, value creation are going to be around the industrial internet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's why GE has completely reinvented their company, sold off $200 billion worth of GE capital assets, and moved into putting sensors onto everything that they make in the industrial ec economy. It's why cities are becoming smart cities, uh, managing energy more, more efficiently, and uh, all kinds of resources in cities are going to be uh, based on the intelligent use of sensors. So I think it's the industrial internet uh, that'll see the, the early wins, that's the low hanging fruit. Eventually it's gonna to touch every industry in, in many ways. I like, I like the term industrial internet, that's interesting. So do you see game changing, what's, what's the next big thing out there that we need to be keeping our eyes on? I think uh, uh, messaging is going to uh, surpass what we think of as going through a browser and searching for uh, different types of web services uh, because messaging is becoming more and more intelligent. We're building machine learning capability, what are called bots, are being built into uh, all of the messaging services out there. So that's going to fundamentally uh, change the way in which people collaborate and work. It's, it's a big deal mm -hmm. and it's happening on a huge scale from companies like uh, Facebook and Google and Microsoft and uh, IBM and others. So to take that very seriously. And I love the fact that you said don't be creating business plans, create your, your customer plan. And that's what SIG is all about. You know, we are only here as a membership organization because we have paying members. So if we don't put them at the forefront of our thought, well, we don't have an association. And you're thinking about things exactly the right way because uh, ideas in isolation aren't worth very much. There's a lot of smart people who can come up with some pretty cool ideas. The reality is ideas have to have context. And the best context is to say, what's a really big customer problem we can solve in a new and better way? And if you do that, you realize that the customer plan is more valuable than the business plan. The business plan is really a budgeting exercise as to how do you distribute resources. The customer plan says, we're going to solve a big customer problem in a unique way. So what's the cost of customer engagement, of customer acquisition, of customer retention, of monetizing the customer, the lifetime value of a customer, always around customer metrics. Customer pl plan can become strategic in a way that business plans probably aren't going to be, typically be. Yeah, I love that. So when I tell my team, I said, I, I want you guys to take risks, but I, if you're going to fail, fail quickly. Yes. So. Uh, and, and, and that's a well understood concept in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's, it's always, uh, you know, a uh, understood approach that you uh, uh, fail fast and keep learning from it. Uh, don't take failure as uh, a disappointment, take it as, gee, what did I learn? Yeah, exactly, and, and, I, and our team has really embodied that, and we've had, you know, not colossal failures, but we tried a few things, and, yeah. and I said, just it, admit, it, it, admit it quickly before it, we... In fact, failure is fundamental for innovation. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, if you aren't taking, uh, you know, risks, you probably aren't really gonna innovate. You know, mm -hmm. it could have just as easily been done by 
a large organization that wanted to stay the course. So uh, failure is a fundamental part of the learning process of innovation. Mm -hmm. And if you can't culturally accept it, and by the way, there are many uh, uh, cultures around the world that don't accept mm -hmm. failure. You fail and you're done. Mm -hmm. uh, well, fortunately, in the U.S., we don't feel that way. We feel failure is part of the learning process. And yet they say by going to school, we, we smash kids' creativity and we teach them failure is bad. Yeah, isn't it incredible that, 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 that we uh, say that students are not allowed to talk to each other because that's called cheating. Uh, and when you get into the workplace, if you aren't talking and collaborating with each other, then they, they say, well, you're not doing your job. Exactly. And in school, you get graded on how many facts you can remember. In the workplace, you get graded on uh, how did you apply the thinking of the team, not just mm -hmm. yourself, to solving a customer problem. So uh, schools are really still working on a 19th century, not even a 20th century, a 19th century idea of uh, what kind of requirements people need to get out into a workforce in the early industrial age. And here we are probably in the third industrial <laughs> age. You know, we went through the, the first industrial age age in the 19th century, went through the second industrial age in the 20th century, the 21st century, uh, the industrial age is all about the smart use of information and being able to do things with it uh, that cross domains, that cross boundaries of geography, and uh, yet we still train people in school as though we're a couple of centuries behind. Well, we are out of time today, but I want to thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure to spend last night with you and this morning with you. You're brilliant beyond words. and. I'm just a huge fan, fan well, for life. And, and I have to congratulate you, Don, on SIG. Uh, you brought together some very talented people. Obviously, people are excited to be here. It's not just a great program, uh, but it's also the networking because you know, talented people like to be around other talented people and, and meet mm -hmm. people they haven't known before. They do. Congratulations on Thank SIG. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, folks, we're going to wrap up today's Inside Edition and hope to see you next time. Thank you.